The musical instrument you're listening to now is an electrically amplified harmonica, played by one of this country's most exciting blues performers. Let's meet him now. What is your name, please? My name is Paul Butterfield. My name is Paul Butterfield. My name is Paul Butterfield. Only one of these young men is the real Paul Butterfield. The other two are imposters and will try to fool this panel. Tom Poston, Peggy Cass, Orson Bean, and Kitty Carlisle on To Tell the Truth. To Tell the Truth is brought to you this evening by Anison, the headache tablet to relieve pain, so relax tension, calm nerves. Anison. And now here's your host on To Tell the Truth, Bud Collier. Welcome again to the Tell the Truth. Good evening, panel. Good evening, Good evening Bud. Bud. Ah, you're looking Good fun. Bud. There came Tom at the tag again, where he seldom is, believe me. All right. In front of you, you'll find an envelope. Open it up. It's marked number one, and follow along with a story which you have not as yet seen. I, Paul Butterfield, am a singer and musician. I started my musical education at the age of eight by studying the classical flute. I eventually found the flute unsuitable for the kind of music which I grew to like best, blues. I took up the harmonica. By cupping a microphone in my hands as I play, the sound of the instrument is electrically amplified. In this way, I can create a variety of tonal effects, making the harmonica sound like a soprano saxophone. With my musical group, I have played and sung at clubs and in concert around the country. The music critic for the New York Times said that my harmonica effects are without parallel in blues or jazz. Signed, Paul Butterfield. <laughs> These three young men all claim to be Paul Butterfield. Let's start the questioning with Orson Bean. Orson? Thank you. Number three, uh, Bob Dylan changed his music to what? what? What is his music, kind of music now called, Dylan's? Well, it's called a lot of things now, really. Yeah, well, isn't there, isn't there a, uh, a name for it, though? Besides Dylanism? Yeah. Uh, well, I re really wouldn't know. What all right, call number it. one, uh, uh, what is that thing called that Dylan uses to keep that harmonica up around his neck? I think it's just called a harmonica rack. A harmonica rack. That's not a bad name. Number two, do you know the uh, nightclub called Folk City? Sure, Gertie's Folk City. Gertie's Folk City. All right. Number, number two, there's a, there, there's a number of jug bands. Do you happen to know the one that comes from Boston? Uh, Quescott. Not really from Boston. Though. All right. Jim Quescott. Jim Quescott. All right. Number... No. Kitty Carlisle. <laughs> uh, number three, who is Larry Adler? Who is Larry Adler? Uh, he's a, um, uh, public relations man, I believe. Thank you. Number two, um, what do you call a man who plays a flute? Flautist. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, number one, there's a, there's an opera called The Magic Flute. Who wrote that? Uh, I really couldn't remember. Do you know number two? I believe it's Tchaikovsky, I'm not sure. Thank you. Uh, number three, there's another great harmonica player who had a, a whole group that, that he went with him for many years. Johnny Pula and the Monocats? Thank you. Uh, there's, there are, well... Tom Poston. This shows his age. Isn't that funny? Uh, who, but he's great anyway. But number uh, one, are you related to uh, the great trumpet man, Butterfield? No, I'm not. Do you know him, number two? Billy Butterfield, yes. No relation? No relation. Thank you. Number three, how come you don't play a, a soprano sax if you make uh, noises that sound like one? Well, I find I get a better sound out of the harmonica. Well, I happen to dig the sound very much. Number two, uh, do you know a, a blues guitarist from uh, Houston? A uh, Negro uh, blues guitarist from Houston? Great, uh, great talent. Do you happen to remember him? Um, uh, if you mean Andy Flugman, I'm not sure. Well, he wasn't the one I had in mind, but I'm sure He's there's more than one. one. Peggy Cat. Hey, number three, just for the record, do you know who wrote the magic flute? Uh, the Matrix. Thank you. Uh, number one, how many holes in a harmonica? Well, it depends what harmonica. There's a lot of different kinds of harmonica. Some have 10, some have 15, some have 20. Thank you. Number two, what are the instruments in the modern jazz quartet? MJQ? Yes. They have sax. They have clarinet. I don't know. 
Okay. I'm really not familiar with the jazz. All right, num uh, number three, uh, who is the music critic for the New York Times? Uh, Robert Sheldon. Thank you. Number one, Boris That's it. Minovich. Time for you now ah, to mark well. your ballot. <laughs> so, mark them at once on the information you have gleaned and mark them correctly if you can. Vote for oh, number boy. one, number two, or number three. And, of course, our team of challengers will receive $250 for every incorrect vote. Ballots all marked, panel? Oh, yes, they are. All right, Tom, for whom did you vote? Uh... I had a, a, I had my reasons for not voting for number two, which I won't go into, but I figured any harmonica has got to know who Larry Adler is. And uh, I, I thought that maybe he should know who wrote the magic food if he started out as a flautist. So I voted for number two. Peggy Cat. Oh, but none of them knew that Mozart wrote the magic food, so that's no fair. But number two was very cool. He said MJQ and all that stuff, but I thought he was putting me on. I voted for one. He sounded honest when he said it was a harmonica rack. <laughs> Orson B. Well, uh, number three didn't know that Dylan uh, uh, coined the phrase folk rock. And number two put me off when he volunteered MJQ for uh, Modern Jazz Quartet because right, he, was, yeah, he was giving us too much information. But it still could be number two. I am an expert in the harmonic. I can well, like to play a, <laughs> uh, a colander covered with saran wrap. It's an unusual <laughs> sound. Kitty Carlisle. I voted for number two. Um, I think that number two probably is the one uh, because he pronounced it flautist, which I think it is. And uh, indeed, you said flautist? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Oh dear, well, there we go again. <laughs> <laughs> well, so there it is. The votes are all in and the minds are solidly made up. Norman Paris and his group are playing the introduction of Born in Chicago, which Paul Butterfield is going to play and sing for us now. So, will the real Paul Butterfield please give us some blues? Thank you very much. Good group to play with, too, weren't they, huh? Yeah. Well, that was great. Much continued success to you. Thank you very much. Uh, number two, what is your real name and what do you really do? My real name is Charles Zetterberg, and I'm a law student at Columbia Law School. <laughs> <laughs> and number three, what is your real name and what do you do, sir? My real name is Thomas Rideout, and I'm the sales manager for Jola Fashions. We sell wigs. <laughs> And checking the score, we find you did all right. There were two incorrect votes at $250 each for a total of $500, gentlemen, for you to divide. And I sincere thanks to you and hope this made an evening out a happy one for you. Good night and God bless you. <laughs> and now let's meet our next team of challengers. What is your name, please? My name is Rosalind Masso. My name is Rosalind Masso. 
My name is Rosalind Masso. Follow along with your copies of this one, if you will, panel. I, Rosalind Masso, am women's editor of the Sunday supplement, Parade. In my career as a newspaper woman, I have visited over 60 different countries in a never-ending search for the offbeat story. I went to Africa to determine whether most people who go on safaris aren't really hunting for a status symbol. I went to Pakistan to interview President Johnson's favorite camel driver. I taught some Russians how to dance the Watusi and performed as a circus clown in Madison Square Garden. Recently, in Japan, I enrolled in a school for geisha girls. A geisha must be a model of culture and intelligence. She must be able to pour tea according to a centuries-old tradition, dance, paint, play five musical instruments, and speak English. To accomplish this, a geisha girl takes a two-year course with classes in the morning and lab work in the tea houses in the evening. While I was enrolled in the school, I did everything that a student geisha girl is supposed to do, except join the union. Signed, Rosalind Masso. <laughs> Three ladies all claim to be Rosalind Masso, and we'll start this cross examination with Peggy Cass. Peggy? Thank you, Beth. Uh, number two, how long does it take to apply that makeup that those uh, geisha girls wear? About an hour. And uh, number one, don't you have to wear your hair a certain way? In a wig. Oh, do the Japanese girls wear? I mean, I know you would, but don't those Japanese girls have regular hair that they can do it with? Yes, they do. They don't have to wear wigs. But some of them do. I see. Uh, number three, what kind of dances do you learn in the geisha house? You learn the traditional Japanese dances. And uh, number two, do you have a little orchestra or like a little combo to play the music or do you just ring bells? I mean, I don't know. Well, there are drums and uh, stringed instruments, a couple of them. And uh, now, number three, how long did you perform in the geisha? Orson Bean. Thank you. Number three, now... The uh, let me get this straight. The tired Japanese businessman is happy and content if you just uh, sing a little folk song to him and pour him a cup of tea, right? That's all, that's all he wants, really, right? That's right. Yeah, all right. Number one, uh, now, let me understand this. Uh, in a geisha house, uh, unlike, say, the bunnies, the, the geishas could, if they wanted to, go out with the customers after the geisha shop closes up. Is that right? They don't. They don't. Now, is that a strictly rule? Is that enforced like the bunnies are enforced? Well, they do have a union. Yeah, but what does the union say? Don't go out or don't go out free. Oh, all right. <laughs> Kitty Carlisle. Number two, how long have they had a union? Oh, four years, I assume. Uh, number three, is this training very expensive? Um, for the girls, it's about uh, $20 a week. Uh, number two, do they ever give scholarships? <laughs> no. You've got to pay? Yes. Number one, isn't this considered a great honor if you have a geisha girl in the family? Yes, it is. Uh, number three, what is a samisan? Uh, it's a stringed instrument, like Thank a you. mandolin. Number two, what is the sash that the Japanese girls wear called? The obi. Number one, why were you with a clown in the circus in Madison Square Garden? The kicks. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> what else? Tom Poston. I had a friend of mine used to tickle a mule's tummy with a straw just for kicks. But, uh... <laughs> Number two, number two uh, did, did you find that people who go on safari in Africa are doing it for status or not? Uh, about half for status and half for fun. Well, that's not oh, just for fun. No, no. But number three, uh, what was your trick in the circus? I was a clown. Yes, but number one, uh, don't all clowns have a specialty? What was yours? I had a big toothbrush. You had a giant toothbrush? What did you do with it? Just, uh, walk. Just a giant tooth? <laughs> now she tickled the mule out of the stomach. <laughs> That's all we have time for. Time for you now to mark your ballot. So mark them at once. No consultation, panel. Just vote now. And without change, once you have marked, vote for number one. Vote for number two. Or vote for number three. Oh. Ballot all marked. Tom, for whom did you vote? I voted for number two because she knew that number two was lying in the last spot when he said Tchaikovsky wrote the magic flute. 
I thought he was right. That's what <laughs> burns me up. <laughs> Peggy Cass. Well, number three looks like it. she's got this marvelous kind of white Japanese geisha girl skin, but I voted for number one because I believe she's the kind of girl to go down the garden and take on a job for kicks. Arson me. How gauche. <laughs> I voted Geisha. Geisha, excuse me. Well, I voted for number one. Uh, I was really torn. Number three knew what the opaque was, and uh, number two said, uh, uh, well, huh, how long have I been sleeping? <laughs> I voted for number one. Uh. Kitty Carlisle. Well, I voted for number three because she did know what a samisan was, uh, which is a stringed instrument, and uh, she looks very pretty, and I think it's number three. Hey, well, there we have it. And once more, the votes are all marked down and reasons have been given. Let's find out now which of these three ladies, in truth, is Rosalind Masso. Will the real Rosalind Masso please stand up? Thank you very much. It's been an interesting few months for years, I should say. Number two, what is your real name and what do you really do? My name is Carly Lewis. I'm a bookkeeper and I work at Associated American Artists. Thank you. And number three, what is your real name and what do you do? My name is Pat Bruyere. I work for Gal Friday, Temporary Office Help. Thank you. And taking the score, we find you too did well. As in the first round tonight, there were two incorrect votes, and that's twice $250. The total, therefore, is a nice round and very fat $500 coming your way, ladies. Thank you for being with us, and we hope you look back upon this as a happy visit. Goodbye, and God bless you. <laughs> and now let's meet our third team of challengers. What is your name, please? My name is Philippe Cousteau. My name is Philippe Cousteau. My name is Philippe Cousteau. Open up that third envelope and follow along with me, if you will, please, panel. I, Philippe Cousteau, Cousteau, I beg your pardon. I, Philippe Cousteau, recently was the official photographer for an historic underwater mission. Under the command of my father, the famous oceanographer and underwater explorer, Captain Jacques-Yves Cousteau, five other oceanauts and I have just concluded an experiment to determine man's ability to live and work deep under the surface of the sea. For three weeks, we lived at a depth of more than 325 feet. Our home was an 18-foot spherical tank called Conshelf 3. We proved that men actually living underwater can work deeper and for longer periods of time than those who must make repeated dives. The motion picture film I took on the Conshelf 3 project will form the basis of a CBS television special to be seen on April 28th and titled The World of Jacques-Yves Cousteau. Signed, Philippe Cousteau. <laughs> Finally, these three young men all claim to be Philippe Cousteau. We'll start with Kitty Carlisle. Kitty? Thank you, bud. What a pleasure to meet you, whichever you are. Number three, what did your distinguished father invent? He invented the aqualand. Thank you. Number two, <laughs> why is it better to stay under the water than to go up and down and make frequent dives? You work uh, much longer when you stay down. Thank you. Uh, number one, has anyone ever gone <laughs> below 325 feet? No. Number three, what did you discover? We didn't discover anything. We proved a few things. What did you prove? Uh, that we can work a uh, long time in, on the bottom of the sea. Thank you. Uh, number two, what is the rapture of the deep? It's a kind of uh, Everest. It's a little bit like a, a drunkenness, drunk yes. When you are going a little bit too down. Thank you. Tom Poston. I love Everest. Isn't that wonderful? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, number one, whose theories? were you attempting to prove on this uh, series of experiments? Uh, no theory, just uh, medical research and uh, scientific research. Well, uh, thank you. Number three, hadn't your father put forth some of these ideas as possibilities, strong possibilities? Weren't you attempting to prove some of his theories? Yes. Just a guess on my part. I really don't know. I assume that that would be true. Number two, where did you learn to dive when you were first starting out? I started uh, diving in the Mediterranean, near Cap Ferre. Well, you must have been a youngster. Thank you. 
Peggy Cat. Thank you. Uh, number two, under which sea did you live for three weeks? Mediterranean. Oh. Uh, but and number three, it says that it was an 18-foot sphere and there were five men in it. Is it weren't you very cramped? Uh, it was comfortable enough. It was? Well, uh, number one, in an 18-foot thing, how many beds could you get in there for five men? Uh, we, we got uh, five beds. Gee. <laughs> like twice as tall as I am. Oh, well, I... Number three. I'm sorry. Time is gone. Orson B. I apologize for the rest of the panel. <laughs> <laughs> number, number two, did you have anything to do with the making of the film World Without Sun? No, I mean, I was assistant of a you producer, but I was very young. I see. Uh, very young? That wasn't... I mean, it's two years ago. I didn't start to shoot ah, at the I time. I see. Number one, what was the name of the first feature film that your father made? Uh, Le Monde du Silence. Oui. And there was a, a, a fish who was like the comic relief in that. Do you understand what I mean, comic relief? What yes. kind of a fish was it? Uh, it was a miru. A miru. Do you agree with that, number three? Yes. The funny... Number two, too? Do you agree? Mm. Number two... Uh... That's oh, all the time we have. Time. I'm sorry oh, to say. Yeah, it's yeah. time for you to mark your ballot. So mark them at once, panel. Mark them quickly and accurately for the one you think is the real one, and without any consultation, of course, and don't change once you've marked. Vote for number one, number two, or number three. Ballots all marked. So, Tom, for whom did you vote this time? Uh, you know what? Well, I, I probably made a uh, dumb mistake, but I think number three is the spitting image of his uh, distinguished father. So, uh, I, th I think that in addition to the fact that he answered all my questions accurately, I thought, I think it was number three. And, uh, ho, 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 jolly green giantess. Uh, <laughs> for whom did you vote? Well, number three looks like Jacques Cousteau. Number two should be in the movies instead of Jean-Paul Belmondo. But I thought number one was the real one, because I thought he seemed so honest and dear. <laughs> oh, Orson B. Well, number one is dear. <laughs> and so is number two. But I, I voted for number three, because uh, it seems to me that he looks like... Uh, Jacques Cousteau as well. And I, Kitty Carlisle. I voted for number three because he looked like his father, but also for a very unscientific reason. He's smaller than the others, and he could fit into this sphere better. <laughs> 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 All right. Votes are all in. Minds are made up, as you heard. We'll find out now which of these three young men, in truth, is Philippe Cousteau. And who better to pick out Philippe Cousteau than his very famous father? <laughs> Captain Jacques-Yves Cousteau. close behind your son, if you will, please, so that we can hear you on that microphone. Uh, what is your next project, Captain? Uh, to go further down and longer. In other words, we can then look forward to another one of your magnificent underwater films, right? I hope so. I hope so, too, <laughs> sir. And thank you for honoring our show tonight, you, you and your son. Let's find out about these two uh, imposters now who did so well. Number one, what is your real name and what do you really do? Uh, my real name is Jean-Claude Arnaud, and I am a sales representative with the French National Railroads. Thank you. And number two, what is your real name and what do you do? My name is Michel Bernard, and I'm the United States correspondent for Radio Monte Carlo. Checking the score, we find that there was one incorrect vote, and that's worth $250. And gentlemen, thank you. It was an interesting story and a fun one, and I hope it was for you, too. Goodbye, and God bless you. Right, that's all we have time for, but it was good fun for us, and I hope it was for you, too. Good night, panel. Good night, good night, Bart. Good night to all of you. We'll see you next week, and of course, see you tomorrow afternoon on the daytime show. And in the meantime, don't you forget to tell the truth. Thanks. To tell the truth, there's a mark. This is Marshall Thompson. Be watching when two escaped convicts are ambushed by an elephant on Doctari in color. Tomorrow night on the CBS television network.
To Tell the Truth has been brought to you by Bicidol Instant Powder, a special formula to relieve excess acid indigestion and take the pressure off your stomach. This is Johnny Olsen speaking, tonight's program pre-recorded.